Now, you never know in your life what's the tiny thing that's going to change the rest of your life. And it was this, really. Welcome to the Sophie Morris Podcast, where I interview the best and brightest, most inspirational women on the planet, in the hope that we can all learn and be empowered by their stories. In this episode, I chat to a woman who has had a huge influence on my life, my mentor and food hero, Darina Allen. She tells me her fascinating story of how she went from being a young girl whose only ambition was to find a nice chap to running one of the most prestigious cookery schools in the world, educating thousands of people how to cook and grow their own food, as well as being somewhat of a food activist, leading the slow food movement in Ireland and establishing the farmers markets movement in Ireland. Darina has had and continues to have such a positive impact in the world of food and is building a remarkable legacy. Get ready to feel inspired. Let's get started. So, Darina, thank you so much for taking the time to chat to me today. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I'm a huge admirer of yours. You were one of my first mentors <laughs> and one of the main reasons I've had the career that I've had in food. So it's a real honor for me to oh, talk well, to you and have you part of the series. So thank you. <laughs> That's really kind. Thank you for your <laughs> kind words. And of course, I'm so proud of my babies. Oh, I'm so proud of you. Thanks <laughs> and so what much. you've achieved. Thank you so much. So um, when I was researching this interview, I was looking back over everything you've achieved and <laughs> <laughs> my God, wow, there is just so much to cover because you've lived such a full and exciting life, you know, <laughs> educating thousands of people, hero to me and many more. <laughs> and just recently you were doing a book tour of China and Australia, promoting your new book, Grow, Cook, Nourish. That's right. So <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute. But um, I was thinking, God, it's so hard to know where to start as you've done so much. <laughs> But I think that's why I would like to start at the beginning, if that's uh-huh. okay. Um, just ask you about growing up in Leash, um, one of nine, wasn't it? The uh, eldest of eldest nine? The eldest of nine children, exactly. And I went to the local Leash school at the bottom of the hill. I used to run home for lunch uh, every day. Mummy uh, co- loved to cook. And wow. uh, uh, so that was always, you know, such an exciting thing, part of the day, running in and uh, you know, the, the smells of often mm. from the kitchen, all of that. Anyway, I, then I went to boarding school in, uh, with the Dominican nuns in Wicklow. Wow. And uh, uh, then, so basically, all I had no ambition really to be any kind of career woman or anything yeah. like that. Uh, but all, was food and cooking a big part of that family life? Oh, it's yes, like well, a, absolutely. It yeah. was uh, my mother loved to cook, as I said, and showing us love. And also she really, really, truly believed that our food should be our medicine and wow. that really uh, the, it was incredibly important to feed us well um, and because uh, she used to always say well if you don't put the effort into putting the food on the table you give it to the doctor or the chemist uh-huh. so that was always one of the things that we kind of subliminal messages that yeah. we all uh, understood and uh, also we always you know sitting down around the kitchen table uh, was a really important part of our life and our childhood. And yeah. we had a kitchen garden, we had a house cow, a kerry cow. Wow. Uh, so the food we ate was simple and really delicious. And she was a very good home cook, which mm. is, in, from, in my opinion, the most important cooking of all yes. is home cooking. And uh, it, you know, it's what memories are made of. It keeps families together. And uh, mm. certainly, you know, the, the, that was a really, really important part of my childhood. Then I went to... Uh, boarding school in Wicklow uh, in the 60s, uh, the Dominican, lovely Dominican nuns, uh, mm. considered to be very visionary nuns. And I all I had no ambition really to be a career woman or anything like that. Did you not? Uh, absolutely My not. God, that's My mad only dear. ambition, and most of us at that time, was to just find a nice chap <laughs> and get married, preferably somebody uh, rich or with a bit of money. <laughs> and and I could would have a few cute little children and paint my nails and we'd go on picnics and have lots of fun. That was absolutely the... Um, the limit of my ambition and the nuns these lovely visionary Dominican nuns were very much encouraging us girls uh, to have a career to do um, architecture or medicine or the sciences or something and all I wanted to do was to cook or Mm. uh, to grow something you know or to to, because that was what I knew from at home really And they were very sweet, you know, they, they saw, you know, it was sort of, well, why would you want to do that, my dear? I mean, you're never going to need that. <laughs> so the very strong subliminal message at that stage was, and of course it continues to be in education, uh, the strong message was, well, these um, life skills, practical skills are of lesser importance than academic skills, mm. uh, which is a big mistake because we need both of them, really. Absolutely. And uh, so because still the emphasis in, ed- is in education is to 
uh, concentrate on a set of academic skills rather than practical skills. Practical. But in my opinion, we're totally failing our young people yeah. by letting them out of our houses without being able to feed themselves properly. Yeah. We're, uh, you know, uh, really making them the skills of freedom. So basically, uh, if we send them out unable to make a meal for themselves, they're at the mercy of somebody else to cook it for them, mm. or they have to buy it, or they have to eat in a restaurant, or they just live on... Um, highly processed food and, and we that's what led see... to that issue that's what led to that issue of so many people just not knowing how to cook and... exactly yeah. so basically you can see the results of this mindset mm. and one of the things that I hope I will see before I hang up my apron is uh, our government seeing the necessity of re-embedding co both cooking and growing skills in mm. our national curriculum it's absolutely essential yeah 100% agree yeah and so just going back, did you do what, what you then studied? You did so then study I did, so basically I decided to do, uh, you know, it was uh, so the nun said, well, okay, if you're determined to do that, then it ought to be a degree in horticulture or else uh, hotel management. So I had to plump for one or the other. So I decided on hotel management. I um, applied to Carl Brewer Street in Dublin, which was very is now DIT. It was mm. quite small at that stage, only three or four hundred. Uh, students but with a very good reputation I didn't get in on the first uh, count because uh, they had an <laughs> IQ test and I'd never seen an IQ test in my life oh, I had no. no idea how to put little triangles into boxes and all of that <laughs> uh, there's a sort of technique obviously that you get so yeah. anyway but somebody fortunately dropped out and I got in oh, wow. so that was quite that was good and I loved that and but of course at the end of that um, course again the next thing was well what do I do now and mm. I still I wasn't a bit interested really in the management things I often used to mitch some of those and go off and play poker <laughs> but I never missed a cooking class and so then uh, I so what to do what to do now long before you were born uh, in the early 60s you could count the number of good restaurants on one hand in Ireland, on one hand in Ireland and probably have a few fingers left over mm. and most of them actually uh, uh, were well, none of them would have a woman in the kitchen. Uh, men were really? chefs, women, you know, just ran little tea shops or were involved in country hotels or something. Wow. So it was very difficult to get into a top restaurant. And I was desperate to learn more about fresh herbs and souffles and terrines mm. and the sort of things that sounded very exotic mm. at that time. But mm. uh, anyway, um, so, and most of my, uh, my classmates had jobs. This was coming towards the end of the course. And, but the job you would get normally and be delighted with uh, was uh, as an assistant manager in, you know, one of the top hotels, okay. uh, Russell or the Hibernian at that stage, uh, and, and uh, Shelburne or something. And you'd you just, have a lovely little uniform and a badge, and it was another word for slave as far as I was concerned. Mm. And there was no cooking involved in that. So anyway, I met just most of my classmates had a job towards the end of the course. I still hadn't, and I remember meeting... Um, in the corridor one day, one of our senior lecturers. Now, you never know in your life what's the tiny thing that's going to change the rest of your life. Mm. And it was this, really. And she said to me, haven't you got a job yet? Do you know, everybody else in your class has a job. Why haven't you got a job? And I told her, you know, that I wanted to learn more about fresh herbs and all of these things. And, um, and basically, she told me I was too fussy. But then <laughs> she said, well, funny. I was, we were at a dinner party the other night, and they were talking about this extraordinary woman down in Cork who seems to have opened a restaurant in their own house out in the country, mm. miles away from Cork City. And uh, she, they definitely, uh, she makes her own ho homemade ice cream. They have a, a Jersey herd, you know, they use lots of fresh herbs. And she writes the menu every day, depending on, you know, what's fresh and in season. And, um, and this was all sort of in incredulous tones, because at that time, remember, no, when restaurants opened they would write the menu and it could be the same 10 years later. Wow, so yeah. it was considered to be really kind of amateurish to write the menu every day. And, you know, you didn't normally... Local was not a sexy word at that time. Yeah. I mean, not for years, really. Mm -hmm. So the idea of not doing restaurant food, which was there were certain kind of dishes like Place Mon Femme or Chicken Maryland or the, there were, you know, Savaran. There was that kind of food that you would eat in a restaurant, which is quite different to home cooking. Absolutely. But anyway, she couldn't remember the name of this woman and she... But that must have been music to your ears. Yeah, I said, no, my God, that's exactly <laughs> what I want. And so she... Um, she said, uh, she said to me, look, I can't remember her name, but she came back and met me a few days later and she, and she handed me a piece of paper and she said to me, this is the name of the woman 
write to her. And of course, the name on the piece of paper was Martel Allen, yes. who's now my mother-in-law. So yes. basically, wow. uh, so that was... Such a sliding was, uh, doors moment. Yeah, so anyway, that was it. I wrote uh, to Martel and became a member of the family by the simple expedient of marrying the boss's <laughs> eldest yeah. son. So that was so how did she just, done. she literally say, come on down? And oh yeah, I, and actually, unfortunately, I had her lovely handwritten letter that she replied to me um, for years and in some tidy up, unfortunately, it got thrown oh. out or something. But anyway, she wrote me a lovely handwritten letter saying, you know, love to have you, children your age, and, you know, we have a tennis court and swimming pool, which you're more than welcome to use. Wow. It was this lovely, friendly letter, totally different to the sort of formal letters that many of my classmates had got, sort of saying, you know, turn up at the tradesman's entrance at 8.30 in the morning. <laughs> and uh, and Myrtle instead had this lovely, friendly letter. So anyway, I came to Bamaloo, oh, and of course, from the moment I arrived, I loved it. Did you? Because it was, uh, Myrtle reinforced the all my mother's values wow. around food. Um, and she taught me the opposite of a lot of what I'd been taught uh, formerly in hotel school, which was, you know, they were at that stage talking about, you know, you know, obviously more, using more and more convenience foods and, mm. you know, uh, freeze-dried and those sort of things. God. And they never seemed to taste as good to me. So <laughs> then when I came to Balmaloo, you know, I, I, of course, Myrtle was in the kitchen all the time. We, I worked side by side with her and I was literally like a sponge soaking up everything she Did said. Did you hit it off with her oh, immediately? Oh, yeah, totally, yeah. absolutely, and a huge respect for her and wow. always, you know, enormously supportive and everything like that. Yeah, yeah um, amazing. Yeah, so that was... Uh, that was, so that was the beginning. Yeah. And, yeah, and then, of course, you married Tim. Mm. Quite young, weren't you? About early 20s. I was 21 and Timmy was 20. Wow, it's incredible. So, yeah, so uh, we got married and uh, then had four children and so on. And still, so I was helping out in Bamaloo every now and then. I took over the kitchens in Bamaloo when mm. Martel was writing the Bamaloo cookbook, which is still in print after, I can't remember, 50-something yeah, years book, yeah. or something at this stage. A wonderful book yeah. and uh, so then uh, we were Tim was in horticulture my father-in-law had originally started a horticultural unit uh, here in Shanagarry there were um, in fairly early on in the 40s I think mm. one of the first tomato growers one of the first green, some of the first greenhouses in the country we were also growing mushrooms which we were exporting as well five acres of greenhouses wow. uh, and tomatoes cucumbers that is and then also 65 acres of apples. So that was a very profitable and um, a business for many years. But then uh, uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, things really started to change in Ireland. We went into the EU, of course. Yeah. And then we also, um, the, the, and the supermarkets began to come on stream. Mm. Uh, the whole cheap food policy kicked in right. as well. And then we were heating... The, in here in Ireland at that time, there was 25% inflation. We were heating five acres of greenhouse with oil. Oh and uh, so, uh, and then, as I said, this cheap food policy kept in. Mm. So people began to uh, the, think that cheap food was their right. So we right. were being, being paid less and less oh, for your produce okay. every time you uh, did it. So, so we challenge. could sort of see that writing on the wall, we had four small children at that stage. Yeah. Um, we, had, we were very fortunate to inherit... Um, this house mm -hmm. here in just outside the village of Shanagarry uh, and the, the the farm 100 acre farm around it and with a whole collection of farm buildings around it mm -hmm. and so I was rearing the children you know and mm -hmm. uh, and looking back I suppose uh, we had no money with absolutely no money and and each year it became more worrying because you know the we were um, be, uh, really making less and less from the horticultural enterprise and it was obvious that this was not going to get better it was right. going to get worse mm. so then uh, at that stage we used to sell our produce to the wholesalers in Cork but then somebody and then because of the all the EU regulations and everything all of that was tightening up and you know even though we had graders and all of that kind of thing there was always seemed to be some reason why they would, didn't have to pay you what they said they would or something right. then somebody said forget about that uh, you know, the new thing now are the supermarkets, you know, deal with the supermarkets. Oh so anyway, God. we got a contract, delighted with ourselves, got a contract to uh, supply one of the big uh, supermarket chains. I won't mention their name because they're still very much in business mm. uh, here uh, with apples, Irish apples. And I remember we'd grade them and take them up and um, Tim and his men would be up early in the morning, not only doing this, but also, you know, pick, uh, picking the tomatoes, the lettuce, so that everything was so fresh going in. Yeah. Anyway... I remember, and then uh, they would, Tim would go in and deliver it into Cork. 
I would get the kids out to school and then we had this lovely moment every day when he would come back and we'd have breakfast together. Oh. And I remember one day him coming into the kitchen and saying, looking very despondent and saying, look, I don't care if I have to crawl on my knees. I'm never doing that again. Really? Some young pup of a, of a, of a buyer in, a, in the supermarket, of course, it seemed to be absolutely, their whole mission was to find something to complain about. Mm. So they didn't have to pay what they said they would and they could, so they could send back some of it, mm. the product, this, that and the other. So it was a nightmare. Yeah. And he said, we have to find... Because they wanted everything looking perfect, didn't exactly. they? Exactly. Like all of this sort of stuff was yeah. really... And, and always the price kept coming down, the, yeah. what the were paid. Uh, it's much, much worse now, actually. But it was... Mm. So, uh, Timmy, we could see there was really going to be no future in this. It was not going to get better. It was going to get worse. So uh, I remember him saying to me, look, we have to find a different way to earn a living. We have to look and see what resources we have mm-hmm. and what talents we have between us. And we have to see how we can put them together in a different way to earn a living. And so that then basically... So we st- did started you have the to, idea about Well, basically, the, the, in the winter in Ballymaloo, and when, you know, it was quieter, the hotel was quieter, my mother-in-law start, uh, started to do some cooking classes and I, okay. uh, when I started, to, when I was there. And then uh, she, I would help her and everything. And then she became, um, uh, she then started a restaurant in Paris called La Fermi Londes to uh, showcase Irish food in Paris. And mm. she knew the French loved uh, the uh, the Irish food and our really good produce. So she went off to Paris and, and did that on top of Banu House. Wow. And then people kept uh, asking for cooking classes the following winter and she couldn't do them because she was too busy with the restaurant in Paris. And so she said to me, why don't you do them? And I said, well, nobody will come and see me, you know, because <laughs> my name was, you know, not in, the, in any way uh, known. But, uh, and, and, but anyway, we desperately needed the money. Wow. So I thought, well, look, why don't I have a go? So I put an ad in, with, very much with her encouragement, uh, I uh, put an ad in the Cork Examiner and I did a series of eight cooking classes on uh, Saturday mornings and uh, down in the White Cottage, actually. And, the, um, and many of the people who had come to Mert's classes, and, you know, which I'd been assisting at, continued to come. Uh, and wow. that gave me confidence. You know, the first time you do something is always the hardest. Yeah. And so I did that. And uh, then th- that, that seemed to go very well. You know, we'd hide our rusty old Renault 4L car around the back <laughs> and they'd drive in their BMWs and their Mercedes and their little mink jackets. And they were just so lovely, those ladies. Wow. And they were so encouraging. Anyway, that was the beginning of it. And then another friend of mine in Dublin um, said, well, look, Drina, why don't you... Because everybody was desperate to try and help us to find a way to earn a living. And we had mm. four children and we were really looking at the prospect of losing the roof over our heads. So starting really, out, you didn't have, you know, from the very beginning, it was it was out of that need as opposed to an oh, ambition yeah. to it, have... This was the Ballymere Cook School was born out of desperation. Oh. I mean, absolutely. Yes. And I mean, uh, um, so anyway, we... Uh, the, my, this friend in Dublin, uh, mine said, well, look, why don't you... Think, would you ever think of doing a residential cooking school? And I said, oh, my goodness, I don't know about that. We live right out in the country, you know, how would they be bored stiff? And at that stage, some people were going to uh, the Court of Blue in London and Paris every year from Ireland. And I thought, well, you know, maybe, maybe we should. Maybe we, we have lots of farm buildings. Maybe we could convert those into uh, some... Um, more accommodation mm. and uh, then the people might come so anyway again desperation is a great thing mm. uh, so we basically uh, in September 1983 we uh, opened the Ballymaloo Cookery School as, as we now know it and actually and, do you know just to stop yeah. there I think I remember the first date you had your, your the date you had your very first class because I'm pretty sure it's the day I was born oh was really it 19... and of course I don't remember the date I think so it was because I've read it and I always stick in my head because really? it was the 19th of September 1983 oh my god <laughs> oh 19th of September isn't that fantastic yeah. so that's a, this yeah. is a really lovely coincidence I yeah. know so, so that 19, was the day I was born 1983 uh, so 34 yeah. yes that's right there yeah. you go so um, <laughs> my goodness but uh, so anyway um and of course we had a terrific job trying to get money from the bank and all that sort of thing but anyway I was going to say yeah. actually because at that stage you know being a kind of female entrepreneur or starting an enterprise oh, yeah. in the early 80s must yeah. have been so unusual well basically there was uh, two things first and foremost looking back now um I remember once being interviewed by a journalist and I'm saying where did this entrepreneurial thing come from mm. where did uh, and I actually, 
the first time I was asked that question, I'd never heard the word entrepreneur before. Can you imagine? <laughs> I was in business for quite a bit. At that stage, all the things we take for granted now. And, uh, and I thought, well, I wonder. And then, but I'm a, I'm a shopkeeper's daughter. My father and my grandfather uh, were um, village merchants, basically, yeah. or what. Uh, and so basically they provided all of the needs uh, of the country village that we were living in. And this would have been no typical way. around rural Ireland. So you'd have a business and it would be a shop, a post office, a pub, uh, maybe under, my, they were undertakers, auctioneers, they sold seeds, they wow. sold grass seeds. They literally, uh, and we also had a bit of drapery and all that sort of thing. We literally, uh, they, they literally provided for all the needs of the local community. So, so you were surrounded by enterprise. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I would, as a child, running in and out of the shop, filling up. At that stage, the tea would come and teach us. The sugar wow. would come in bags, so it all had to be weighed up and everything like that. So you did all that. Uh, so I would do that, and you might be, I, I'm looking back, I'm sure I was horribly precocious. <laughs> but the other thing that that does, without you realising is, is it, you know, you learn social skills, mm -hmm. because you, you don't, you're not shy and you can interact with people. And also you see opportunities, you know, it was sort of like a game almost. So I hadn't, that was part of my childhood, didn't even think about that. And then, so when, before the the uh, cooking school and all of that here as a young married woman desperate to make a few bob I made apple jelly and jams and marmalades and things and I used to sell those to Wendy my sister in law at the Bani Malu, uh shop wow. to sell and then it's uh, obviously then, from your upbringing with your father well, it obviously, obviously had it in your in your blood about yeah, it the must enterprise have been, I mean looking back now of course mm -hmm. and then the other thing is we tidied out a couple of rooms in the house and did B&B, &B, and then eventually the children got bigger and they would refuse to move out of their rooms. <laughs> and uh, then the other thing uh, uh, that I did was we started... We, Ballymenu, you see, were very busy this time and very much overflowing, so I, that's why we could do the bed and breakfast. People mm. would come over here and stay in the Nita mm. Uh I'd do breakfast over here for them. But uh, And then uh, also then there were people who were coming to Ballymenu and they would stay a week or fortnight, and oftentimes they... We're looking for a slightly less expensive option. So we did up uh, some, did a lot of it ourselves, actually converted a uh, farm building into some uh, a holiday cottage. Okay. And so by the time, fast forward to 1983, by then we had accommodation. Uh, we had one holiday cottage and I think we had we had either done another one or then we did another one, a uh, second one, the, the white cottage. And so we had enough accommodation for about... Um, oh, I think about 12 or 14 so, students. So, so that gave you so the that residential... Gave me a common, yeah, exactly. Mm. So then um, we... So then on the first course, we had nine students, but a little ad in the Cork Examiner and the Irish Times, and we hardly had the price of the ad now. I was going to say, because yeah. it was before, obviously, online marketing, social oh, media. How would you have gotten the word out there? Thing. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, just, so the best place was the back page of the Irish Times or in the Examiner. I did. Mm. We did a little tiny ad in both of them. Ballymaloo Cooker School opened September 1983, and we just waited and with a, with a contact number. And, of course, Ballymaloo, the name Ballymaloo was already very well known at that stage. Right, yeah. Now, and... Uh, so then we and we waited then for uh, the phone to ring or indeed for the post every morning. So there was mm. always great excitement if a letter came in the post, as they say. <laughs> and then my father in law was always waiting, he'd be having his breakfast. And if he got a phone call, a company, I think to come to the phone at say 9 30 or something, it meant we'd got another booking. But wow. anyway, so it was like on tender hooks to try and get enough people to mm. start. And the other, so my parents in law. Uh, when I went to the, maybe I, this is, I'm getting too detailed. No, it's fine. I was going to so ask you, um, going to ask. the money, that was it. I was going to say, yeah, did, did you have You talked yeah. about that. Now, so basically the the 1980s and the, the late 70s, 1980s, uh, sorry, the early 1980s, there was another big recession in Ireland. And, mm -hmm. you know, people said, oh, for goodness sake, you, you know, the bank, they were, everyone was giving out about the banks and you couldn't possibly get money, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Anyway, I worked out, and I'm really bad at figures, still am, uh, that we needed, between us, we worked out that we needed about 18,000 to do this conversion of small farm buildings into some kitchen and dining room for the cooking school. Mm -hmm. And... Um, a member, which was kind of more or less on the back of an envelope, but a, a friend of ours who was um, a great support to us was had done um, finance in Trinity, and he said there's no point in going into the bank with that. We need to write it out properly, <laughs> and he literally had to. Now this sounds ridiculous, but it's totally true. He had to 
uh, explained to me the difference between the words debit and credit. I mean, that, that. Uh, so, and uh, then I made an appointment with the bank manager of the savings bank, actually Cork Savings Bank at that time, where we had our little tiny overdraft, and um, uh, to go in and talk to him and tell him about this brilliant idea I had to convert some farm buildings out in Chanagary mm. into a cooking school. And wow. so he, uh, you know, everybody said you have to hope of getting money because basically, you know, they're very difficult to get money from anyway. But anyway, went and as, in, as a borrowed, woman as well, I'm sure. What? As a woman as well, oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Trying to start a business indeed mm. and and uh I didn't I never thought that way though I never thought of it did being you know disadvantage no never you obviously had the and support of the yeah, family very, my father was a very civilized man as well who very much respected women and mm. of course the in Ballymaloo the the Allen family I don't know whether I think it must have something to do with it they're Quakers so mm-hmm. men and women have always been equal in wow. in in that in the friends. so you were always encouraged yeah so it never that wasn't one of the things that that actually it never stopped me doing anything because I just didn't even think of it as an obstacle. Oh, that's wonderful. Anyway, mm. So I made uh, uh, I made um, appointment to the bank manager. Went in, and I remember borrowing a little suit so that I'd look properly you know, <laughs> impressive. And in I went, and I started to tell the bank manager about this wonderful idea I had. And everybody said how difficult the bank managers were and everything. And he was so nice to me, and he gave me tea and biscuits and everything. And the more I talked, the more enthusiastic I became. The more laid back he was, and seemed to be really enjoying it and mm. everything and then at the end he said well look I'll just have to I was only asking for 18,000 which I mean I know is would be it's obviously mm. it would be more now but basically even at that stage um I, I should now I would know yes. that when he said to me oh I'll just dis- I'll have to discuss it with my colleagues that that really meant no because he mm. could easily have made that decision yeah and I didn't know and I couldn't wait for the post again <laughs> oh, so yeah. by the end of the week I got a letter saying well no uh, basically no oh. and the sort of whole tone of the letter well it was really well we really need to kind of save you from yourself more or less. <laughs> I mean, you know, eating their words they would be now absolutely a preposterous idea <laughs> eating their time. words but I remember I didn't see him for years then and I'm recently or not recently it's about 10 years ago now I met him again at a drinks party did around you Cork. and I said do you remember me and he said of course I do I said do you remember me coming into you you know and asking for money he said of course I do and I said well <laughs> You said you didn't give me the money. I said I was convinced that you thought it was a great idea. So why did you? <laughs> why did you not? And he said to me, "Well, he said you were so enthusiastic, and once you, you know, he said, he said once you started, I thought, well, I might as well sit back and enjoy this." <laughs> I said, I bet you're sorry. Now you He's now, definitely I, sorry. I've actually, I've actually borrowed so much money since that have done very well out of me. But anyway, yes. We had a great laugh about it. And, uh, but then, so when I, uh, then I thought, no, I think nobody had ever said no to me before, ever actually, properly. Um, and uh, th- then I, my parents-in-law, of course, knew about this. We'd been mm. talking about this idea of opening a cooking school because everybody was kind of desperate for us to find a way to, mm. you know, to kind of keep the roof over our heads. And so I, I said to my father-in-law, my mother, we, you know, the bank won't give me the money. And um, and uh, Ivan said to me, my father-in-law, whom we all adored, said, well, look, let me, let me, I'll have a little chat with Myrtle. So he and Myrtle obviously chatted and he came back to me a couple of days later and said, look, forget your bank, go to our bank, we'll guarantee your loan. And of course, any bank will give you money. If, if you have a guarantor. guarantor. Fantastic. So that was the... What you, you, the leg up? The leg up, got, fantastic. Or dig out as as what you call might say at that stage, which may, meant that I could continue. You could actually start anyway. So then, so we got started. We built. We were ready the day before the the students arrived. We had nine students, I think, on the first course, and then eleven. Uh, and so on and then with very quickly it went up to 16 18 and then we were bursting at the seams so after wow. 10 years we expanded and went over to into the great big apple shed that we're now in but basically at that stage then there were several decisions one mm. was what to call it and Darina Allen's name meant nothing uh, would I call it Shanagari Cooking School because at least the Shanagari Pottery was well known? And then my parents in law, in again, t- typical of their generosity of spirit and actually their belief in me, yeah. uh, said, Well, look, we think you should call it the Ballymaloo Cooking School. And of course, that was an incredible oh, wow. uh, advantage because the name Ballymaloo was already very well respected, well known, yes. and a certain expectation uh, around the, what would be delivered on from that name. And so encouraging for you because oh, for them yeah. to take their, that's their reputation Absolutely. as the name. So yeah. it was a big act of faith in me. So then I really had an incredible responsibility to uh, 
deliver what was expected from that name. And of course, I would have done it anyway, but I mm. felt that even more strongly. Wow. And we had borrowed so much money and they had supported us and guaranteed our loans. So I was determined wow. that it was going to be as good as anything anywhere in the world. And now, of course, it is yeah. one of the most prestigious <laughs> cookery schools in the world. Oh, so well, you have more than delivered. Uh, that's very nice of you to say. But I yeah. went to also then, I went, I thought, well, I'm going to go and look at the ones that are considered to be the best. Mm. So I couldn't, I hadn't, couldn't afford to go to Paris. So I went to the UK. I went to see the, um, uh, the uh, went and made an appointment to the Cordon Bleu in London with the Prue Leith, Prue with the uh, yeah. La Petite Cuisine down and thing with the uh, da- that was down the south of England and then there was another one uh, in Woking uh, that I went to see and they were all really nice and you know very generous and all of that with me and I also looked to see what they were charging okay. and I thought well um, if I'm going to do this it's going to be as good as anything anywhere else in the world we're in the middle of a farm we're very very lucky we have our own produce, produce. Mm. we have our own gardens we have mm. uh, and so uh, that's an extra element that many of those cooking schools didn't have yes and I thought I will charge exactly the same as they're charging and that brilliant really was was quite a cheek at that stage if you if you, if you can imagine mm. uh, but I I thought I've always felt I know nothing about business. I've no training in business, but I do know a couple of things for sure. Right. One is you need to promise less and give more. So right. we've never had a marketing company as such. So mm. I was determined. No, we didn't have the money actually uh, for exceed for expectation kind of, essentially. Exactly, exceed expectation. So mm. we certainly didn't have the money to do lots of advertising or a PR or something like that. So basically, I just had to make sure that everybody who came left feeling that they had at least got value for money. And mm. I remember I was charging the same as the Cordon Bleu in London or wow. Pru Leeds, mm. and preferably much, much more, so that each person who left here would do the advertising for, for me you. in the sense that they would feel, look, we got really good value for money for that. Mm. You know, it's worth, it's uh, worth it. spending your money there. So promise less and give more, or as you say, exceed expectations. You must charge enough to do a good job. That's fantastic more business and advice. More yes, people uh, nowadays, they, they reckon the secret to it is to charge less than somebody else. I always say to my students, never charge less charge more but you need to be better and it needs to be clear why you're charging more well, and then the you best can do a good advice. job because yeah. a lot of the time people are not charging enough to actually do the to, quality to they to need to the deliver they need to deliver and that's so the it's problem. a very mm. fundamental uh, thing yeah, yeah. Mm. well that brings me on to the school because I of, of course did the 12 week course myself in mm-hmm. 2008 and what I fell in love with was that whole ethos of eating seasonally sustainability mm. you know we were on a rota where we would go out in the morning with the gardener and help pick the herbs and the veg mm. that the school needed and it was just magic living in that kind of world for for 12 weeks where it was very much garden to plate yes. um, and that is different to the other schools you know it wasn't just about teaching the the cooking skills it was about teaching about ingredients yes. and the importance of ingredients um, well, and I think sourcing really good quality uh, sourcing really good quality, quality. yeah I, the whole secret as you very well know now is if you start off with really good quality produce you need to do so little to make it taste good exactly Otherwise, that's the you key need to be a magician yeah. that's the key yeah. and um, but I think everyone who experiences Ballymaloo says the same thing it's like being in just a wonderful bubble when you're here <laughs> but you know everybody works so hard yes things. but it, it is true yeah. there's a, just a lovely vibe about the whole place and um, but it is a big operation now. You have a lot of how, over 70 staff, is that right? Uh, no, no, we have 55 at the moment. Wow. And I'll be slightly more in the summer, but we employ 55 people plus. It goes up to 60-something wow. in the summer with extra students in the, you know, yeah. down in the farm. and So I'd, lo- I'd love to know, how do you keep those values so at the core with having yeah. so much staff? Because you just, you feel that when you're here, yeah. you know, that ethos. And it's... That's not, I don't ever, th- I never thought of that has been in any way difficult mm. the staff uh, and when when I say the staff uh, I mean I prefer to call say the people who work with us uh, they are just as invested in and as proud of mm. the business uh, here as uh, any of the rest of us it's 
uh, they love being part of something that's sustainable and that mm. that has a feel. I think maybe there's an extra feel good factor about yeah. something being real and all of that. So certainly that hasn't been a difficulty. It hasn't been something no. I've had to try to do. It's I like mean, just you walk f- into the school door. I know a lot of people say that's oh my god, there's such a buzz in here. Yeah. Now the buzz is the buzz of mm. of people enjoying what they're doing, yeah. working really hard because the students. Um, even though we don't officially start until nine in the morning, um, now, this is on the 12-week course. We now do three mm. three-month certificate courses in the year, and they're totally aimed at people mm. who want to get the skills to earn the living from the cooking. And yes, lots and lots that's the one I did, yeah. As well. yeah. Uh, but basically, on the 12-week course, you know, they, they don't really officially have to start until nine in the morning. Well, every morning at half past seven, there are some students outside that door waiting to come in. Mm. And they're meeting the gardeners, they're going out to the bread shed to Do make bread. Uh, the sourdough bread. They're yeah. going down to the dairy. They, to um, Some of them, will, they want to learn how to milk a cow. And then they, you know, they, they, with the milk, they make yogurt and the cream, they make buttermilk. They make, uh, with the cream, they make butter and buttermilk and kefir and cheese and everything. So they're it's absolutely so excited about what they're learning. They also also do butchery classes last night now they were all plucking pheasants uh, for the pop-up uh, oh. dinner on Saturday night uh, so and then they learn how to smoke food they learn how to I mean it's, it's even more than when you were here yeah you know? wow. so I find now that they're those sort of extra almost forgotten skills or, or extra life skills mm. uh, are more and more appealing to people and, Absolutely. and people and of course since the second year we've had students coming from abroad um uh, so now, of course, it's very uh, cosmopolitan and has mm. been for many, many years. The school has been operating since 1983. So there are 14 nationalities on this course. But the main mm. reason why students come, particularly from abroad, is because the school is in the middle of an organic farm and gardens. And mm. they can see how everything is produced from the, the vegetables and herbs and, mm. and the, you know, how to rear the chickens and the... The, the you know the cows the beef they can see all of that the pigs they can see how it's produced right from that much hackneyed phrase now which wasn't there at all when I started <laughs> call from the farm to the fork yeah and they absolutely they love loved it and it's you know and I suppose the other thing about char- like you were saying about charging the right you know a good price yes. is because then you are going to attract people who are really serious about this oh, and, yeah. and want it so they are coming yeah. with that now that's the other lovely thing from our point of view and I have. Uh, is that we the, the students who come to the school and now we take uh, 60 something students and we have one teacher we have always had one teacher with every six students because it's very intense and full on yeah. and in fact we have rather more than one teacher to every six students uh, but anyway regularly meeting people saying oh I'm going to do that three month course at some stage and mm. you can imagine if you decide to take three months off you've got no wages for three months mm. and uh, and you have saved up for several years for that, I can tell you, you, you just hang on every word. Absolutely. And it's amazing how invested they are. You know, we have students could be still out there uh, in the evening, um, you know, doing something at seven o'clock in the evening. And that's, that's extracurricular. We have a lot of extracurricular things that people mm. can do or not do. I mean, even milk, learn how to milk a cow. Amazing. We have seven Jersey cows and a little tiny micro dairy here. And, you know... Uh, every skills. single one of those students wants to learn how to make a cow, <laughs> and, you, and but of course that's a ch- that's a choice they make. Yeah. But could you imagine it if it's I wonderful. put on the thing learn, that they no. could have to learn how to make a cow? Uh, none of them would probably yeah. would probably put people off. But instead of that, that's true. People say, "Well, I can milk a cow. I don't have to milk a cow." Fell <laughs> into you know, what interview they're going for? It mm. gets the conversation going if they can say yeah. if they can say can milk a cow yeah. well that was another thing I loved about the course because you definitely did teach that it is possible for us to make a living from oh, food yeah. and that didn't have to mean being a chef which oh, I loved yeah. yes so there was practical advice on how to actually start how a food a business yeah. Yeah. and I loved that and that really is what sparked my ambition to start really? a food business yes. and how I ultimately ended up creating my first business yeah. which was was cookie dough so yeah. I, that was the element of the course I really loved. And I know yeah. now you've got a number of successful chefs and food entrepreneurs who oh, are yes. past yes. students. So and literally all over the world now. All over the world. Do. And we have, I mean, only the other day, I, one of the modules I do is how to get a job. And, and also yes, telling people, uh, telling the students, 
calling out this big long list of over, over 40 things and we keep on adding to it of the ways you can use your cooking skills to earn a living with the from the 12-week course and it goes on and on mm. and now more than ever it's it's there's so many opportunities because you know of course anybody who wants to write about food they can start a blog yeah uh, somebody who wants to uh, hasn't got much money and wants to start doing a little food business it could be starting at a farmer's market mm. and of course we have lots of examples of that like with Claudia McKenna who started in that yes, way yes. Uh, they can get a food truck uh, and oh I, the food trucks are so exciting, so exciting. Um, and they they can do a pop-up dinner in their house and get started get a bit of things so there are so many opportunities so many. they can do food tours and then there's all of the other mm. cafes all of the different businesses and there's, now the the possibility yeah. of online oh exactly because my business now is online nutrition and yes. and cooking education online yeah. yeah so teaching people how to actually live eat healthily yes. through just unprocessed food yes. really essentially and so badly needed so, so there's so many different and then some uh, the, all the, the you know the some of our past students are teaching kids how to cook yes. they're teaching older people how to cook they're teaching you know people in disadvantaged communities so I also very much encourage them to give back to their communities I always say to them on the last day I'm such an old I'm such an old headmistress but I say to them <laughs> look remember you guys now each and every one look remember how fortunate all of us are to have been in a position to be able to learn how to cook and how to grow because we also very much encourage them now to grow some of their own food as well and the students on for example on the summer course each of them have an option of having a little raised bed or to have a, p- a patch of land to grow something wonderful so remember that you have had these advantages which many people haven't and I want each of you at some stage to teach somebody else how to cook something even if it's only a bowl of soup or bread or something just in your own community or you know and so on and I I sow the seeds of you know just quietly getting on with giving back to your community in some way as a little thank you for being so fortunate to be in a position to Mm. be able to learn these things so they're really good about that and they do some re- fundraising mm. things and so on as well wonderful okay we're nearly towards the end now yeah, um, sure. I just Sorry. want to say that yes you are definitely famous for your endless energy <laughs> around the school um, some organic food <laughs> <laughs> fantastic yeah um, but you're married now over 40 years. You have four yes, kids. 47 and years, actually. 47, and wow. 11, 11 grandchildren. 11 and, uh, grandchildren. And we're very um, lucky. They all live within five minutes of us here. It's ridiculous. Really? Because, yeah, well, that's yeah. what I was going to say, because, yeah. you know, having that balance between work and personal life is something that everyone these days strives for. And, you know, I'd lo- I think listeners would love to hear how you've managed that. With <laughs> well, I don't have a magic formula either. <laughs> Anybody who says they have, I believe... Uh, you know, I, I would have a question mark. Yes. Uh, I'm forever, uh, you know, um, full of good resolutions about, you know, uh, taking more time off. And I am, I'm now uh, 67 years of age. So I am, uh, we've got an amazing team here. My brother, Rory O'Connell, of course. Of course, uh, yeah. uh, Who was founded the school with me originally. Yes. Uh, he is very involved in the school, as is Rachel uh, my daughter-in-law and then we have a whole wonderful team yes. of teachers many of whom you would recognize from when you I were do here. they're all still the same yeah and so basically I uh, and I travel quite a lot mm. I, and I am gradually you know uh, pulling back a little bit but then there's always something else I want to get involved in yes and, your, uh, your energy is just still as strong <laughs> as ever and enthusiasm well, long may that last but yeah. also there's some you see we're very fortunate that our 11 grandchildren and uh, our children and their uh, husbands and all of that and wives all live within a few minutes of us here. That but there's help. several things that I feel terribly strongly about is the, the hanging on to the family meal. So uh, almost every Saturday night we, there's, we have a big family uh, supper here and it could be any members of the family and some of the kids bring some of their school friends and so on as well. And uh, I know lovely. in their own houses, sitting down the, around the kitchen table is still a very important thing to hang on to. And, you know, it's really important in many ways because in a family, if you're sitting down around the kitchen table, even if you're only arguing, you're keeping the lines of communication open. And that's Mm. really important. So Mm. that's something we really treasure. And it's never anything fancy, you know, what people want when they sit down home cooking. It's the most important cooking as far as I'm concerned mm. always. And it could be a great big roast chicken with lots of stuffing and roast potatoes and gravy and, and vegetables and all of that. And they always want pudding, of course, as well. <laughs> so um, that's, and that's what memories are made that of. Is, what that's what I was going to say. All the memories yes. are made around sitting down with yes. your family and eating yes. good food. And yeah. it's also an investment, my goodness, 
uh, feeding, you know, putting nourishing, wholesome food on the table is such an investment in good health and indeed in happiness. And Absolutely. it's a, you know, wonderful, gosh, people work so hard nowadays. These things, you know, this, this thing is so worth hanging on to for the quality of your life. I mean, yeah. one and only life. Uh, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there are, we come back nine or 10 times, but we haven't really met anybody who did. So <laughs> no. one might as well try and Absolutely. sort out what are the important things as well. In the end, family is the most important thing of all. And then we're well so said. lucky to have a lovely, you know, a, a lovely team working with us here. Mm. But the other things then through the years, of course, I've become involved with many other things and I many ways I'm often described as a, an activist now in the whole food area slow food movement yes. you've been leader in Ireland really. that's right that's it's the wonderful. slow food movement I've been very involved in and believe so strongly in the yes. ethos of the slow food movement the the philosophy of good clean and fair food and actually I've just come back from China where I was at the international slow food congress which is just happens every four years the first time in Asia and this the main focus of that this time was um, on uh, you know the, the impact of climate change on uh, countries and communities around the world wow. and it's obvious basically I mean that you know the countries that have done least to exacerbate the problem mm. and obviously uh, climate change has to be part cyclical but basically um, it's uh, the countries that have done least to exacerbate it are the ones that are having the direst consequences so it's wow. you know there's it's there's climate justice as well as Mary Robinson always said mm. well, slow food's been very important to me and then the other if you asked me which you didn't uh, which was <laughs> was there any one thing that I was most if I thought about it proud of having been involved in and maybe the thing I would choose would be, I was having restarted the farmers market movement I was going to I have oh, this I was on my list I was gonna that. say what I was saying was um yes so the cooker school has been in business over 34 years mm-hmm. um which is such a legacy but <laughs> on top of that you've done so much more like leading the slow food movement in Ireland and mm-hmm. establishing the network of farmers markets in Ireland mm-hmm. which is That's so right. important um, so I wanted to know really what what is your secret for continued innovation in that sense? Well, you know, and drive really. I know, and you see, and I don't even, I don't, I, I when I'm asked that question, I don't quite know what the answer is mm. because I just see a sort of I see a need or an opportunity, and I just think well, let let's have a go at doing that, and I've always been one to rush into something uh, often too fast uh, but you know instead of proselytizing about you know whether it would work or whether it wouldn't work or something I just decide I'm going to do it and then I just make it work yeah. uh, and uh, you know I, I'm sure there are plenty of things that hasn't worked but I like to I don't know I managed to put those out of my head <laughs> <laughs> forget about those just forget about the ones that did and, uh, and the so one thing... for me, the farmer's market thing was a very important... Of all the things that I've been involved in, I think the farmer's market... Sorry. Of all the things I've been uh, involved in, I think getting restarting the farmer's market movement in Ireland has been the thing that I think I'm most proud of, if I thought about it, and has definitely yeah. made a difference to most people's lives. Because many people Absolutely. now say to me, and it's on documented many times... If it wasn't for the farmers markets, particularly farmers and food producers, I would not be still on the land. Wow. So I know that it has made a huge difference to many people. It's given them a, given them an alternative way of uh, earning a living and uh, and adding value to their produce on the farm and selling directly to the consumer, so they can Absolutely. get the full amount of money into their hand. And smaller farmers and producers and it's educated consumers as well about how oh, to actually yes. shop for food. Now they're about one hundred and sixty or eighty in the country, and yeah. the first and one I started about. Uh, oh golly about 25 or six years ago in the cold key in cork actually wow. that was even before middleton so that i love the farmer's market movement i think it's incredibly important it's i i go in very often on saturday into the middleton farmer's market on the stall and it's like pure therapy it's uh, <laughs> you know you have the interaction between the stall holders you have the meeting the uh, the customers and mm. always in a farmer's market there's an extra element the customers are so grateful for the fact that the market is there so they have mm. can buy a different type of food and Absolutely. then you the children come in and they meet the uh, you know the, the the person who's growing the cabbages or whatever or exactly know, they, it gives yeah. that connect because i think with the with these days and with supermarkets there's a real disconnect for yes. consumers of where 
this food actually comes from exactly. that they're eating and yeah. having the farmers markets it does it gives you that that connection yes. with, the, with the producer and where this food has actually come from which yeah, is so important so right and it is such an important yeah. need actually so and then the other thing that I've been doing behind the scenes for a long time now is I head up something called the artisan food forum where yes. we actually link up with the food safety authority of Ireland three or four times a year in meetings and articulate the challenges and the difficulties that the arts and food sector are having and that has been a really valuable thing because a lot of the time I think the health authorities and the regulatory authorities they know that people are not happy with the something or other but they don't necessarily know what their what the problem is so mm. we've made a lot of progress there um, it's like sometimes I think it's one foot forward two steps back but mm. basically uh, and you know the whole unfortunately now the whole regulatory thing has become an industry so mm. more and more and more of these blinking regulations rolling in on top of people yeah. and a lot of them are totally out of proportion to the risk involved so we try to keep them more proportionate we try and bring Bring people's concerns and challenges to the food safety authority uh, and we've you know then we can chat about it and see whether this is reasonable or not wonderful well Darina thank you so much for sharing your story with me today I know all the re- the people listening will have found your story incredibly empowering I've known a lot of it as I'm a huge fan as you know <laughs> but um it's such a wonderful story and so empowering for for women in particular so thank you so much well thank you for coming for it. and also though to say a thank you I couldn't come and visit you without bringing you an edible gift Gift. So I brought you a jar of my homemade Nutella. Oh my God, my grandchildren are going to be all so, cycling up to me with lots and lots of big hugs. It is and one of my favourite things. So, so beautiful. And, and I thought, I what could I bring Darina as a gift? It has to be something edible. It oh, has well, to be. Well, that is so beautiful. And, and I love the Kilner jar with all these lovely bows and ribbons and twine good. and luggage labels well, on it. So thank you so much, Darina. Thank you so much. And actually, just really quickly, there's three very quick questions I'm asking everyone yeah. in the series. So just really quick ones. Um, what book are you reading at the moment if one oh, or the most recent book uh, The Secret Life of Trees is one I'm reading at the moment and then I'm always dipping out in and out of several cookbooks I brought several back from Australia wow. uh, where that because I've just come back from doing a, books to, a book tour with my latest book Grow, yes, Cook, Grow Nourish. Cook Nourish uh, so I brought back uh, uh, several books from there wonderful and one um, of the the uh, Three Blue Ducks, uh, uh, those boys' cookbook, and another one from uh, Belinda Jeffries. So I've, I've been dipping in and out of those as well. Wonderful. Um, okay, second one is name one woman um, that you would say has inspired you the most. Well, if I could only choose one, and there have been many, yes. I would think I would choose Alice Waters of Chez Panisse in Berkeley, mm. in California, who has started, among other things, uh, she has... Uh, started the uh, the edible school garden movement which mm. has been in, an inspiration to so many of us because it's one of the things that inspired me uh, to start the Slow Food Educational Project here in East Cork where we link in with nine local schools wow. uh, all of which must have a, a edible school garden and the children then are taught how to grow and how to cook and we send a chicken coop Gorgeous. and two hens to all of the schools so the children learn how to keep hens as well and how eggs are produced and I, I, so I started this oh, maybe about 15 years ago but I really thought particularly during the recession uh, if we can teach children how to grow some of their own food how to cook and how to keep hens it doesn't matter what happens in the economy what the bankers do they'll be able to look after themselves that's brilliant I love it um so on top of everything else you've done, Darina, you've done written a ton of cookery books. They're all <laughs> pride of place on my bookshelf, that's oh, for sure. You, um, but you're now on to your next one. Well, Grow, basically, cook, I nourish. suppose I've... Uh, so I, I've written, at this stage, I seem to have written 15, 15. Uh, books. What an achievement. Uh, uh, and the, the latest one, which has just gone, had just been published, uh, is actually a slight uh, variation, and it may just be the most important book I ever write, because I feel so strongly about this. Uh, and it's called Grow, Cook, Nourish. And actually, uh, there's three years of work and research have gone into that. And basically, for all the time I was writing it, I, it was always, the, the working title was, for God's sake, grow, and in brackets, and cook some of your own food. Mm. Because I'm really... Con- 
deeply concerned about the deterioration in our national diet. And I'm shocked at how quickly we seem to have handed over the power over our food choices yeah. uh, to the, a few multinational food companies and, and the supermarkets. Can, it's not really fair to expect them to have our best interest at heart or our no, health. I mean, they're a business. I know, they're a business and their responsibilities to their shareholders. So, uh, But for a lot of people now in their busy lives... They may know the kind of food that they should be eating, but it's extremely difficult to find it if you can only do one shop a week or something in a supermarket. So uh, a lot of people who'd like to get to the farmer's markets can't necessarily get to them. So I'm saying to people, look, take back control over your food. The most important thing in your in your, your families, all of your families, uh, life and health and everything, what's keeping, the, uh, you know, which is what's our very existence and take back some control over that. It doesn't matter whether you live in a mm. high-rise apartment or whether you live in the country or the city, you can always grow something. You can yes. grow salad leaves on a windowsill or something. Mm. And my God, is it fun once you get started. So, I love that. Uh, Taking so back control. Take yeah. back control. Take back control. I absolutely and love that. that book is called Grow, Cook, Nourish. Grow, and Cook, actually, Nourish. A wonderful book. It's getting a terrific response. I think the timing might be quite good where more and more people are beginning to say, well, look, I think we need to do Enough is enough. More. Enough really? is enough. Enough yeah. is enough. And then, of course, if you do grow something yourself and if your children are involved in helping you to grow things and mm. realising the magic of, of a seed germinating and so on, mm. they'll eat everything. There's no, mm. there's no, there won't be any it's problems. M- they will yeah. just, anything they grow, they'll eat. Because anything it's magical. It's magical. It's magical. Exactly. And uh, a lot of people have terrible problems with their children not eating properly yes. and so on. And this is one very good way to to uh, uh, to solve this. I love yeah. that. Yes. Mm-hmm. No, because I, I work with a lot of mothers myself with teaching women mm-hmm. how to, similar like what you're saying, take back control of the food yeah. and your family's health by, yeah. by cooking from scratch. And yeah. one of the big things I say to them to help with their kids is get them really involved in the cooking. Yeah. You know, yes, exactly. because when they're so involved, right. they yeah. will show interest and they will then they want, want to eat it. it. And the last question is, um, if you can think off the top of your head, name one woman you would like to meet to see me interview next on this series. Oh, mm. well, uh, apart from my mother-in-law, Myrtle Allen, who's now, of course, 93, who is yes. so inspirational. But uh, if I think, I mean, some of the wonderful uh, cooks uh, like Marta Jaffrey, Claudia yes. Roden, oh, uh, brilliant. these are all iconic. And, uh, I love Mada Jaffrey. Yeah, and have certainly been a big influence on my life. Brilliant, I will definitely, I'll be giving them a call maybe. Yeah. <laughs> well done, well I'm so proud of what you've achieved, darling. Thank <laughs> well you, Darina, thank you so much. Yeah.